Hi guys, I've just finished work for the day and I'm off to meet my girlfriend for dinner and drinks in an area of London called St Giles. The best way to travel in London is to walk or cycle, but walking and cycling takes time and time is a luxury I'm rarely afforded. And taxi journeys are an expense I personally can't frequently justify, so I mostly travel by tube. If you're visiting London for the first time, I would definitely recommend it. Get yourself an Oyster card and don't worry about making mistakes. You're only charged when you enter and exit the system, not for changing trains within it. So if you go in the wrong direction or get on the wrong line, trains are frequent, they're only minutes apart and the journey time between stops is short. So you can switch to a train in the opposite direction and all it will cost you is a few minutes. The tube system can look pretty daunting to visitors as a schematic diagram as it does not show the geographical street locations of the stations, it only shows their relative positions to one another, the line they are on and which stations act as interchanges for the different lines. But it does make it amazingly clear and simple to figure out how to get from one station to another anywhere on the network. So before you look at a tube map, you need to first look at a geographical street map and figure out which station is the closest to the location you wish to go to. Once you get the hang of using it, it has the potential to save you hours sitting in traffic. Its only drawback, although a symptom of its success and not a symptom of its failure, has been such a great and convenient way to travel makes it popular and therefore often crowded, sometimes very crowded. Here just outside Tottenham Court Road tube station is a road junction known as St Giles Circus. It's a crossroads and currently under development and reconstruction for a new crossrail station. Overshadowing St Giles Circus is the centre point building which has currently been transformed from office space into luxury flats. It gained listed status in 1995 and has stirred controversy ever since it was originally built in the 1960s. There is also a homeless charity called Centrepoint, and although separate things, they and the building have become somehow linked in the minds and conscience of many Londoners. I'm not sure if it's seen as a symbol of homelessness or greed, or maybe both because after its completion as an office block, much of the building remained vacant for years while the then owners tried to find a tenant prepared to pay to occupy the whole building. And the owners were wealthy, wealthy enough to wait unsuccessfully so that the building remained unoccupied for nearly a decade. Then in the 1970s, frustrated by this huge space being empty while people slept on the streets, it was occupied by campaigners for homelessness in London and only afterwards was it let on a floor by floor basis. And ever since the building became associated and symbolic of the challenge of homelessness London faced and still sadly faces every day to day. Like much of London, the St Giles area is very much part of the very modern city. But London as well as being a modern city is also an ancient one. So despite constant redevelopment, there is always a mix of both the modern and the ancient everywhere you go. St Giles today, like the majority of London, is a very safe place to visit and has some fantastic new developments, amazing restaurants and only the wealthy can afford to buy a home or apartment here. I read in the press recently that prices for the flats in the Centre Point Tower would originally be marketed at prices ranging from £1.8 million up to £55 million for a penthouse. However, the St Giles area has a far from prosperous and dark history even by London standards. First off there was a leper hospital here, the next tragic milestone for the area was the Great Plague of 1665 it began here and went on to kill an estimated 25% of London. Then in more recent history the area became a rookery or what we would commonly call in the developing world today a slum and this was one of the worst slums Britain had ever seen 150 years ago. It sounds like long ago, but the Victorian slums across London were only cleared or in modern language redeveloped in the living memory of my grandparents, only to be replaced by even higher density vertical versions in the form of council tower blocks, which have been demolished and regenerated all across London to this day. There's been a church here since the 11th century. This new one, well, I say new, it's 285 years old. The latest one was built between 1730 and 1734. The St Giles Rookery was a maze of gin shops and the artist Hogarth's engraving Gin Alley is believed to have been set here. This was a web of secret alleyways with all the crime that comes when poverty and wealth live side by side, which the police of the day had little hope of overcoming.
Charles Dickens came here in 1850 and was shown around but apparently required a whole squad of police officers to protect him and he often wrote about it and referenced it. It was the poorest part of London and the iconic slum. So no doubt if you've read about Victorian London slums or seen one dramatized in a movie, it was probably in some way based on what Dickens documented right here. Capital punishment was abolished here 50 years ago, but long before that, for a period of history, London's gallows were in the corner of this churchyard. And at that time, executions were public. People would have come here to watch criminals hang. Much of the St Giles area today has now undergone modern redevelopment, but some of the 17th century terrace buildings, or at least their facades, survive here in Denmark Street, which is synonymous with the music industry and has been for over a hundred years. This was the centre of the UK music industry, attracting everything and everyone to do with the music industry. Managers, promoters, magazines, record labels, or just somewhere to buy a guitar pick. In the 1950s, the first recording studios opened in the street, and during its heyday in the 1960s, the Rolling Stones recorded their first album here at number four, Regent Sound Studios. Other artists to record here included Jimi Hendrix, The Who, The Kinks, and Black Sabbath. More advanced studios like Abbey Road eventually made it obsolete and it closed, and the shop was then the first Forbidden Planet comic book store, and then when they outgrew it, a bookshop, but it's now back in the music business. This whole area makes you realise one thing, and that's that change here has been constant. The area has been inhabited and the change has been documented for over a thousand years. And inevitably change will continue, as it will in the rest of London. It can be positive, it has been positive, yet simultaneously it's sad and challenging and for those really facing it, it will understandably provoke fear and resistance. It's interesting to capture these areas of London, in some way they feel like shrinking islands of nostalgia. And one day, sadly, someone may be watching them to rekindle a memory because they're long gone. I'm meeting my girlfriend for dinner and drinks here at Byron Burgers in central St Giles. I'm early and she's been shopping in town so we'll be fashionably late. So I'm going to go in and take a seat and get a drink while I wait. I love root beer. Whenever I go to America, the first thing I buy when I get off the plane is the biggest bottle I can find. Now, it's not impossible to find here in London, in England, but it's not widely available and they sell it here, so I'm gonna order one of those while I wait. And here she is. She wasn't too late today. She's even arrived before my root beer. Byron say their mission is to serve proper hamburgers the way they should be. They source good beef from Scottish farms, they mince it fresh every day, they cook it medium so it's pink, juicy and succulent, they place it in a soft squishy bun with minimum fuss and fanfare, and then they serve it in a comfortable environment with a smile. That's what they say, however the contest for best burger in town is a hotly contested competition. Burger aficionados a few years ago when Byron was just starting out raved about Byron. It topped best burger lists and it grew. It was and it is hugely popular and successful. Byron has grown exponentially since it began but the burgers are as good today as they were in the early days. However the thing with food critics, they always look for the new and the niche. So today Byron's probably not topping many independent best burger lists but I think they would all agree they still serve a very good one and in my experience a consistently good one. Okay, you may wonder why Chloe's drinking my wine, but something we'll often do if we go somewhere for dinner and drinks where they sell wine by the glass as well as by the bottle is we'll order two small glasses of two different wines and both try each one just to see which we prefer before we commit to a bottle. Now Byron often launch special burgers and if they prove extremely popular they may be given a permanent place on their menu. And that's what's happened with the B-Rex burger. A year after its first appearance as a special, it's been added to their new classic specials menu. And we've been invited by Byron to come and try out the newly relaunched B-Rex burger. The B-Rex is based on their head chef Fred's nostalgia for his first ever hamburger. A few years ago, before I started vlogging, while we were out for dinner and drinks, Chloe introduced me to Fred in a gastro pub in Chelsea called the Admiral Codrington where at the time Fred was the chef before he moved to Byron. 
It's a fantastic little pub, good food and drink, great menu, and an amazing little dining room at the rear. But when Fred worked there, people were coming from far and wide on word of mouth just for the burgers, they were so good. I met him once and spoke to him briefly, but the one thing I got from the conversation was his passion for food, particularly burgers, and he was telling us about trying to develop his own burger cheeses and so on. It's great he's found somewhere he can really explore and develop his passion, both for him and for us. Along with our invite came this little toy dinosaur and a pack of temporary tattoos, and Chloe can't help herself. So she's taking branding to a whole new level. We've ordered the B-Rex burgers and also sides of French fries, onion rings and macaroni cheese. I love the mac and cheese at Byron, you get the layer of stringy baked cheese on top. And below the macaroni is gooey, rich, creamy and of course cheesy. I love courgette fries and quite a few places serve them but very very few get them right and neither does Byron. I've only had good ones in Italian restaurants and they're amazing with the texture and bite of potato french fries and the same sort of size as McDonald's french fries. Every time I find somewhere that makes good ones I ask them how they prepare them but obviously the waiting staff never know. I have once was taken to the kitchen to see the chef but he was so startled to see a member of the public and his English was not very good. He struggled to tell me but I think he dehydrated them before frying them but I'm not sure if he meant in an oven or in sea salt. The guy looked so scared of answering my questions I left him to it and that restaurant's closed now. But dehydrating them before frying them makes sense as most places they're not cut thinly enough and they're basically soggy on the inside, not soft. So we love zucchini fries but when you've had good ones, although the fat soggy ones most places serve edible, they're simply disappointing because they can be so much better. The B-Rex burgers look amazing, I'm really looking forward to this, I want to dive straight in but we better take a few snaps for Instagram and Twitter first. It looks delicious. Medium cooked beef, a soft squishy bun, onion ring, streaky bacon, American cheese, jalapeno peppers, pickles, onion, barbecue sauce and mayonnaise. I come to spice things up even further with some of Byron's hot sauce. The B-Rex burger tastes as good as it looks, it's delicious. I think it's one of Byron's best burgers yet. In fact, I think what we've got here is the ultimate blend of comfort food. A bacon cheeseburger, mac and cheese, french fries and onion rings. I'm not sure my doctor would share my enthusiasm for it, but someone told me they saw him pushing a trolley round the supermarket full of sausage rolls and copious amounts of booze. So he's not exactly practicing what he preaches either. I want a little Heinz tomato ketchup for my french fries, but this stuff is pretty stubborn when it comes to leaving the bottle. The mac and cheese at Byron's fantastic. Below the baked surface, it's gooey, rich, creamy, and of course, cheesy.
we did a pretty good job of demolishing all of that we're going to have a glass of wine and think about looking at the dessert menu We're both pretty stuffed after all that food, so we're going to share a caramel and honeycomb blondie with vanilla ice cream and caramel sauce. That looks delicious, so we get a quick snap for Instagram and Twitter before we both dive into it. Okay, so that was Bar on Hamburgers in London, St. Giles. Fantastic food, fabulous service, bravo Byron. And the most important part of any meal, good company, but don't tell her I said so. I really enjoyed that. Thanks for watching guys, if you like this video please hit the thumbs up like button and if you'd like to be the first to see my new films, the subscribe button. Toodles!